Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the, outside, at the outset of this debate, it is important to recognize the competing interests that the United States has to deal with. First, the interest of ensuring that unlawful combatants are dealt with because they pose a serious security dilemma to not only the state apparatus, but also the citizens of that country, while also simultaneously dealing with the issues of due process and ensuring that these people are dealt with in a reasonable manner. We think the best way of ensuring these people receive fair outcomes and, and uh, like, that we actually are targeting the right types of people is to have a court in which this is done. I have a four-point model that I think will solve this quite important. First of all, we would note that this will be a closed court. The information that happens in these courts will not be released except uh, until, for instance, in the same way that the CIA releases documents, which is in a 25-year period or on court uh, or on court appointment. Like that's the only way that these things will be released. The second is that the judge of this court will be selected not as a federal appointment, but instead by the American Bar Association. This assumes and ensures that this will be an independent arbiter and not just some federal lackey that can basically hand down these decisions as the federal government would have. But lastly, we would also designate publicly funded legal counsel for the defense of these individuals to ensure that they receive fair representation. That is the model that we're going to with under this uh, under our side of the house. Uh, no, not this time. I have clarification. It's a clarification. Yeah. You say so. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. What information will the court request? What will the court be deciding? And what will be the standard of an unlawful combatant? Sure. Okay. So a few things. First of all, the standard under which a court would actually take this action is if they deem this person is an a an actual threat to the state and poses real security concerns. B that there is no alternative feasible measure for us to be able to uh, deal with this person for a number of reasons. And C that this individual act like this individual is guilty of the things that are established. I think that's pretty straightforward uh, arguments now. First of all, I'm going to talk about why this is necessary. Second, I'm going to talk about why the court process specifically deals with these things. And third, I'm going to talk about the alternatives and why they're all crappy and we shouldn't want to deal with those. First of all, why this is necessary. First, note that the United States is under threat from these individuals. These individuals ensure that people live in a state of fear, wherein they can't actually believe that they're, they're, going to be, uh, they're going to feel safe, and this necessarily, I think, changes the way people live their lives. I think that at the point where these people hold a monopoly on, on this sort of violence and can do these sorts of things to American citizens and make them feel that way, and are a constant threat to American citizens, the United States has an obligation to ensure that they are dealt with in some manner. It isn't feasible for the government to, for instance, take direct military interaction in Pakistan to stop these individuals, A, because Pakistan isn't going to like it, and B, because we frankly don't have the ability to do these things, and as a result, targeted killings are one of the only ways that can actually take care of this. That being said, if the United States has an obligation to ensure that these people are dealt with in some manner while reducing the costs, not only in terms of capital, but also in terms of the human cost, if you can do that with a drone strike, we'd necessarily prefer that. But lastly, under this argument, we'd say that if we are able to terminate, terminate threats to the survival of the state and that might harm people, that, that is something that we should try to achieve. I don't think it's reasonable to just let these people act as long as they aren't part of our own state because non-state actors are the ones that threaten the United States of America and we need to be able to deal with these mechanisms somehow. I suggest to you that unless opposition provides you a way we can deal with them, that uh, then they're not going to be able to win this round. But let's talk about the court process specifically. I think this is quite important. Note that an independent arbiter is necessary to ensure that those that we target are indeed unlawful and are actually guilty of these sort of things. We think that without the ability of, for a court to actually arbitrate these things, what you have is executives, uh, for instance, like Barack Obama, who can frankly, on executive order, kill basically anyone that is deemed a threat by the CIA. This person is afforded no legal counsel. They are not actually given any ability to determine whether or not they are guilty of the things that they do. And we think this is unjust. At the point where they do have some representation, we think that the ability to be able to determine whether this person, A, has any basis to be a security threat, B, has committed anything of any likely cause, is incredibly important. But I'd also say that under the, under the current model of how things are done, this person gets no defense, right? They have no ability to have their interests represented. And yes, it is going to be a little bit, I think that it would, it would not be, it would be probably better to have someone who uh, was from the, the country defend them, but since that is unfeasible, it is better to have someone from the United States defend these people as opposed to no one. Go ahead. Why would we provide this sort of representation to unlawful combatants when we don't provide it to lawful combatants? Like in war, you don't give representation to people that are at war with you. Okay, there's a, there's a couple of reasons for why we would do this. First of all, I'd say that the reason that just, just doing this for lawful combatants isn't a good reason for why we shouldn't do it for unlawful ones. I think that's faulty argumentation to begin with. But second of all, I'd suggest to you 
that insofar as we are killing these people, we are assassinating them, and they are not members of our state, and we are not in the same, like, in, in many ways, at war with them, there is some burden for the government to prove at least to someone that they are guilty. I don't give, a, I don't frankly give a care at all if side opposition wants to say that we are at war. Uh, I think that we have some burden when these people are, are have the threat to murder someone to prove that they are actually a threat. And unless they can do that, I think that's incredibly damaging. Sir. I'd also suggest to you, uh, yeah, go ahead. So you're still going to breach the sovereignty of other nations in order to kill these people, right? Yeah, and so in my first okay. argument, I think I tell you why it's necessary for the United States to do this. Because if we do not breach the sovereignty of these states, I say that these actors act in perpetuity and can do what they like because governments like Afghanistan and Pakistan will simply not give us the leeway to deal with these people. I think it's telling that Osama bin Laden was hidden within that country and there's still no real result as to why he was there to begin with. I don't think that you can rely on these states to deal with these threats themselves. I think that's pretty obvious. But let's, last, let's talk about alternatives. Because I think there's only three possible things that can happen without a court process for to be able to deal with these sorts of issues. The first is an executive order in which the president can basically decide who is going to be targeted at any single, in, in any single instance and have them gotten rid of. We say that this is bad for a, new, a number of reasons. The first reason this is bad is because there's no accountability here. The president can just do this, and because it stays secret for almost their entire term, it never has to be justified to the public, and it only comes out after. Also, we see this person gets no defense, and they are murdered without any due cause. That's necessarily bad. Second option you could have is some sort of congressional approval method. But frankly, this is really terrible because you can't rely on these types of people, especially in a Congress that is so large, to keep these types of secrets. So the idea that you could have Congress do this, especially when they have national security interests, to deal with any terrorist at any point in time, that they would receive a fair trial, I think is unreasonable and unreliable. They would never actually be effective at this job, and it would get out to the media too quickly, alerting terrorists, and they wouldn't be able to do anything. The last option, which I think is what second opposition would have you believe is the right course, is to not assassinate these people at all. Me and Mubana would argue that this is the worst of all possible worlds, where you allow these actors to act in perpetuity, allow them to plan and strike out at you without any ability to defend yourself. We think states have the right to defend themselves where necessary, and should not be forced to have other states compel them. We are very proud of you folks. I thank the speaker for his speech and to open the case for the opposition. The House recognizes the leader of opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. James and I don't believe that this model is required by the circumstances. We don't think that it stands with legal precedent. We think it's, in, it's discontinuous uh, with the current legal standards that we have, not only for dealing with lawful combatants that we face, but also with domestic populations that pose a risk to the state. Um, so we think it's a foolish idea. I'm going to explain that in my own case material. Uh, just really quickly, let me talk about this model and a few additional questions that I have beyond that point of clarification I asked. Um, so one of the really important questions that I did ask that I don't think was sufficiently answered is kind of what this court will be deciding and based on what kind of information. Like it's, really, it's really important for me to know if the court, uh, by the ABA appointment, is going to be determining on the basis of a propensity, or sorry, a preponderance of evidence, whether or not this person is an unlawful combatant or beyond a reasonable doubt. A lot of the like normative force of his arguments derived from an analogy to a court proceeding in which you would have like beyond a reasonable doubt as your standard. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but these are things that probably should have been clarified. Just a couple things on the model. Closed court, absolutely fine, no problem with that. The judge being selected by the ABA, I think that's weird, and I'll make fun of it a little bit later on, but yeah, fine. Um, third, they're going to be funded, they're going to have legal counsel, that's fine, I don't see how else you would do that, so okay. Uh, but a few things that are just really important about why this model is not practical, and I'll get into this a little bit more in my own case material. Um, but we frequently don't even know these people's real name. We are involved in a global war in very, very difficult to access regions using drone strikes against very real threats to ourselves and our allies that are willing to blow up people on the ground and blow up our own troops. The idea that you should be able to contact a court in the middle of a live operation and determine what the person is, the evidentiary standards, the evidence that you currently have for why this person is guilty before you can do anything in real time and prosecute a meaningful and effective war is absolutely ludicrous. Okay? Secondly, a lot of times you don't have the kind of evidence that would stand up in any kind of court, right? What is it, like, the government's just going to manufacture evidence? If the ABA doesn't have any way of, like, checking this evidence against the government that gave it to them, they have no way of meaningfully discerning whether or not it's true evidence. Like, this person's saying they're going to blow up a building in America. And you'd be like, uh, the defense 
like lawyer points out that the, the government gave us this evidence and we have nobody to check against this. What are you going to do in that situation? Like you can only defer to the one authority that has the information. So this is either a meaningfully meaningful roadblock to roadblock to important prosecution of conflicts, or it's a speed bump that means nothing in the in the process whatsoever. Okay. Uh, lastly, just a point um, on the independent arbiter. Uh, as I'll get, I'm just going to get in my positive matter because it'll answer it pretty implicitly. Okay. So uh, three things that I want to talk about really quickly. First is why unlawful combatants just don't have this right. And there was no analysis brought to you by the government, and I think they'll fail as they try throughout their bench to establish that such a right exists. Secondly, I'm going to explain why, if this is a meaningful, meaningful roadblock to our status quo operations, um, then it is debilitating to important military operations. And third, I'm going to talk about why the executive branch is the appropriate locus of these decisions, not the judiciary, especially a weird ABA-appointed judicial body. Okay, so first, um, why unlawful combatants don't have this right? Look, I think there are two ways you could say there's a right. One is to say that within a normative framework, humans qua humans have this right. But if we were to say that was the case, it would mean that you can unlawfully, unlawfully engage in violence against a state and the innocent citizens of that state, and you have a presumed right for that state to try you and your guilt before they take any action against you. Let me just remind you on a domestic analogy that right now, if you are a gangbanger and a cop is pursuing you and you start firing bullets at him, he can shoot you immediately in the head. He doesn't have to go to court. He doesn't have to get a warrant. He doesn't have to do anything. And I think if it's true that unlawful combatants present anything like the threat that a person in a gang shooting at a police officer does, then we probably don't have additional burdens to them and their basic human rights. So A, no human right exists like in abstraction that should be guiding to us on a normative level. And secondly, no descriptive legal precedent exists for this, for like a preemptive trial taking place for targeted James. killings. Go ahead, back up. We'll get to you in a second. So I think the argument you're making is a bit of a straw man. In these cases, we don't actually know if the people we're targeting have committed the crimes you're talking about or not. Shouldn't we at yeah. least try to I'm, figure I'm, out if they have? Andrew, you're going to get a chance to talk about a very specific example I'm about to get into in my second point, where I'm going, to give, I'm going to walk you through a scenario and how your model will work. So you'll see this, okay? Second, why is this debilitating to ongoing military operations, right? Assuming this is not meaningless. Assuming there's a real check that's putting, put, putting in place here, okay? Let me tell you about how targeted killing might actually work. Um, special forces are on a range patrol in northwestern Afghanistan. From one of their very credible sources, they hear that there's an ongoing Al-Qaeda meeting um, of high-level officials nearby in a village, okay? They call this in and ask, can we take a strike against this village? Under their scenario, now we don't know if these people are guilty per se, Andrew, that's true, okay? But we're in the middle of a war, and you clearly do not have perfect information when you make wartime decisions. Under their model, you would call back the ABA-appointed judge and be like, so there are some people, uh, this guy says, are in a room, can we blow them up? And I'm guessing your guy would say, that's evidence that we can't rely on, never do it. If you never do it, it's entirely debilitating to the war effort, because that was credible evidence from a real person saying we can take out high-level Al-Qaeda officials right now, and you wouldn't pull the trigger, or would you? So in a certain scenario, where you have suspect, you suspect that, for instance, a gang is doing uh, like bad actions in a house. Would you be in favor of just being able to do that because the opportunity is going to disappear later? And if we don't do that, well, that's just terrible. All right, I use the domestic analogy to point out why you're giving rights to people that don't exist for them. Obviously, you can't willy-nilly kill gang leaders in the United States because they're U.S. citizens that have descriptive rights and normative rights. Once they start firing at you, however, as people in war are wont to do, you have the right to attack them. That's why they're disanalogous in the right ways for me and the wrong ways for you. Also, note, judges, it's damning they didn't answer a very simple question there. I'm assuming his answer is they would not allow that strike to take place, and you know this is debilitating for those kind of operations. We have concrete, reliable intel from a source on the ground that would allow you to take out high-level Al-Qaeda officials, and they wouldn't do it because they wouldn't have the kind of evidence that would stand up in a court that would actually be a meaningful block to this action. Not cool, guys, because we need to kill high-level Al-Qaeda officials if we want to win this war, and you think it's a war worth fighting, which we happen to think is true. Third, why the executive branch is the appropriate locus of these decisions. Okay, the executive branch is preferable for making these determinations for a number of reasons. First of all, because their judicial official is appointed by the ABA, which is a really weird political organization to appoint this person. Um, like I, the ABA right now is like collects fees and like puts out publications and gives like rating. I don't. I'm not going to waste a lot of time on this. Okay, but enough, enough to say this is a weird model. Um, and, and the politicization of this person is more likely to take place when they're appointed by ABA, which tends to be a more political body um, than like the process of appointing judges, which would then have lifetime review. Secondly, the judiciary, because it's politicized, is more likely to make bad decisions that are not content neutral or not based on the information. So for example, if you didn't like the Bush administration, as a lot of people from the ABA didn't, and he wanted to get a strike, you can make a political position as a lifetime appointee with no repercussions to you to simply block all of his efforts because you think it's it's not
not cool. Um, the Supreme Court did this when they put a moratorium on the death penalty with no constitutional basis that had to be reversed later. The courts have been known to block action that they think is politically unfavorable, and they don't care about the war effort in the same way that the executive branch does. The executive branch has the information and the incentives in place. Uh, James is going to talk more about this. We're very proud to oppose. I thank the speaker for a speech, and to continue the case with the government, the House recognizes the Deputy Prime Minister. Why would we provide legal representation to unlawful combatants if we don't do that to lawful combatants? I think what side opposition is missing here is that we have rules of war for lawful combatants. They know what to expect. They've engaged in military action against you. We have expectations in the international community of what they can expect in terms of retribution. They've volunteered for this. The problem with unlawful combatants is that they may not have done these things, right? They might not even be unlawful combatants. You don't know that until you go to a court. Lawful combatants are relatively easy to identify. Unlawful combatants need to be identified as such in order to not afford them the protection or to go ahead and abrogate uh, their, their rights because they've signed up for this in the way that we've commonly established in international law. I think side opposition really doesn't understand this, uh, that they've missed this context as part of the debate today. Second opposition's gotten up on a POI and told you that we would breach sovereignty, right? We point out to you that the purpose of sovereignty as a system is to establish and maintain an international order, that unlawful combatants fundamentally throw this off, that they don't deserve to have their rights protected in the same way, to have their country's sovereignty upheld in the same way because they're actually uh, undermining that international system that establishes and protects those rights for them. Okay, so James gets up here and gives us what he claims will be questions, but is actually one question, right? So he's like, what is this court going to decide? First, uh, is there a, like going to be a propensity of evidence or a reasonable doubt? And then doesn't ask any other questions. Um, so I think that you can expect the court to use different evidentiary burdens based on how urgent the case is, right? Yeah, yeah, this yeah, already yeah. happens when you call a federal court judge in order to get a warrant to search someone's house. Yeah, yeah. Based on how urgent that warrant is, how much the police officer subjectively thinks uh, will happen, uh, the court may or may not grant a warrant and will look at different standards of evidence in order to do so. And I think that that's perfectly acceptable for the court to have that discretion. The point here is that Obama doesn't get to pick up the phone and go, all right, well, you know, like, sure, I don't have to be accountable about this. Or uh, better yet, uh, because, like, the CIA is so good at their job that no one would frankly know. Uh, and that Obama will have some sort of check on his desire to uh, have military action engage. Yes? Okay, so as we can get past, like, nebulous, like, they'll figure it out. In the scenario that I gave you, where you have reliable, concrete, actionable information that there are all kind of officials meeting in a village a few kilometers over, will they block that or will they allow a targeted strike on that building? Like, I'm not the federal court judge in question, right? But I would say that they probably would, right? That they probably would if they were convinced by the evidence at hand that there's a likelihood that this guy is, is, is an unlawful combatant. If you can guarantee that there's reliable evidence of this, yeah, sure, why not? I think that the false dichotomy you set up of like, either this is going to be too effective or ineffective at all, is just false. I don't think that this is a meaningful example to perform before us. I think that courts have to make difficult decisions on a daily basis and end up doing them and using the reasonable evidentiary standards. I don't think that that's uh, really as much of a problem as you present. Okay, so then you talk to us about how unlawful combatants just falsely, or j just don't have a right to this, right? You talk to us about the police and about how if someone fires a gun at the police, the police have a right to retaliate. Well, yeah, like on the field, if someone's firing at you, I think it's pretty clear that you can fire back. That analogy is not an analogy because it's not analogous. Uh, and then you move on to something that might actually be a real world example, which is the Al-Qaeda thing. And I really just don't think that it's going to work the way that you would like it to work, in which the federal court judge would hesitate because he doesn't believe the evidence. If he believes the evidence, he's going to grant the order. And if he doesn't believe the evidence, then he's not going to. I think it's pretty simple. And I don't know why you think that that's the meaningful uh, reason not to do that. You tell us that it's debilitating to ongoing uh, military operations during the war. 
we point out to you that if you are in a war, there are rules of war, you can use those against lawful combatants, right? Like, you don't need to go to a court if you think that someone is fighting lawfully within the confines of the international system, that they, that they have certain things that they're expecting. Um, and then you tell us that maybe they're not quick enough. But that's actually a pr problem of funding, right? Like, if you give these courts enough money, then they're going to be able to make decisions on a pretty uh, frequent basis. The military has enough money to do that. But B, courts are remarkably quick in scenarios like warrants, where they need to make a split-second decision about whether or not they're going to allow you to abrogate someone's very fundamental rights. And they've shown a propensity for doing that well, that where there's accountability, these people can actually have meaningful representation, that there can be an actually just outcome. Third, you tell us that it, the executive is better, right? First, you tell us that the ABA is bad. All right, well, uh, as opposed to the ABA's slight inclina uh, inclinations for politicization, you would have us go to the federal board body, which is overtly political, right? Like, right there's a, like, someone's going to be political here, and we hope that when someone's a judge, they're not going to be the ones being political. And frankly, your criticisms apply to any decisions that any judge ever makes, right? Any judge has the capacity to be political, particularly if they're elected. Any judge has the capacity to make decisions that might not be in line with what the executive would truly have wanted when they signed something into effect. But we have to admit that if we have any faith in our judiciary whatsoever, and we should, right? And if there is a problem with our judiciary, we should fix it. But to the extent that we have any faith in our judiciary, we need to go ahead and trust them to be those neutral arbiters of any decision that we have, particularly when we're talking about the targeted assassination of someone without maybe any cause to do so, with something that really should be reviewed by an independent arbiter uh, and not uh, decided in a split second by an executive that has a vested political interest in a certain outcome. Um, they tell you about political, uh, they tell you that the judges might not like the war effort on a political scale. Judges also sometimes don't like or really like jail sentences. Judges like and dislike a lot of things and if we have any faith we need to continue to do so. I think that side opposition misses in a big way the fact that this debate is really about the security threat posed by unlawful combatants as opposed to the due process that should be afforded to them. That's the real tension in this debate, and I don't think that they've engaged meaningfully on that front. I don't think they've recognized to you that there might be a need for due process in a case in which we uh, are we're literally planning to assassinate people that might or might not deserve it. I think that they don't give sufficient weight to how that might be abrogating someone's rights, and that they might deserve these rights despite not being a citizen of the United States, or whether they are, or, or sorry, regardless of whether or not they're a citizen of the United States. I think it's important to recognize that people's lives are valuable on the international scale, that these people haven't volunteered to be lawful combatants, aren't doing things that would identify them clearly as such, and as a result, we need to decide whether or not they're unlawfully combating, whether or not they're a security threat. For these reasons, right and I stand. I'd like to speak before a speech and to continue to the opposition. House recognizes the deputy leader of the opposition. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. I think that there's a sort of fundamental tension latent within the opening speakers from the government, which is a desire to couple sort of human rights and humanitarian ideology with the hardline necessities of war. And what we've provided you is that that tension is ultimately bad, that we're already committed to wars, and this is answering the bottom of your speech, and that that ultimately curbs our ability to engage effectively in the war on terrorism. What we've heard is initially that there will be a curbing of the executive that will have uh, more effective and just decisions, and then the second speaker attempts to just illustrate that it's a speed bump, that it's just double-checking things before we continue along our merry way killing clandestine transnational actors. This is the worst of both worlds. I'm going to go through the arguments that are provided by the previous speaker and unpack more of the substance that my partner, the ever-sweet killer, brought to you. First, we hear that there are varying degrees of speed, right? These things will be figured out on a case-by-case -case basis. You should initially note that this response is nebulous at best, ultimately lacking any sort of standard of what constitutes the kind of evidence they're dealing with, or whether or not they're dealing with the standard of reasonable doubt, or what the court is actually deciding. 
But if we assume that it's not nebulous, we've already explained how there's a sort of double bind latent here, that it's a question of whether or not there will be any sort of efficacy, which would in turn cripple our military action, or if in turn it's just a speed bump. And I think the answer we're getting is that it's, that it's a speed bump, that we're going to just dot our I's and dot our J's, cross our T's, and then continue on our merry way. The other argument I'd like to make here is that this assumes that the executive doesn't have internal authorization processes. There is indeed internal oversight within the executive branches. Members of the CIA do in fact have to refer back to Langley before they just begin killing people, which solves most of your qualms. And indeed, that's on a case-by-case -case basis that solves the nebulous standards that we're getting from you. Then we hear that, um, well, well, no, we don't hear anything, actually. The killer's argument, so that we don't even know these people's real name, and that all of the evidence that will be provided to the court is ultimately suspect because it's provided by the government or by field agents. And often in these cases, we don't know who these people are. We just know that they play a particular role in a clandestine transnational operation. All that evidence is questionable material that isn't presented to the court because it's provided by field agents that can't be present by, na by virtue of the nature of their Job, which means that they would never meet the standard. Or it means they would always meet the standard because you're going to defer to the expertise of field agents, which smells like the status quo. The double bind has been clearly answered. You're either crippling the military efficacy or you're doing nothing to prevent them. Top hat. If your entire standard is that this is going to hurt the war effort, would you ever possibly consider the fact that we kill many innocent people in these countries might perhaps actually harm the war effort in that these countries become far angrier when this sort of thing happens? Um, it was interesting because I was arguing with the killer during prep, like, I don't know if this thing actually constitutes a split, but indeed, my split, thanks for flagging it, will be about why the executive has an incentive not to do that. Right? The executive is something that is fundamentally incentivized against killing civilians because it destroys our ability to receive cooperation in the Middle East where we require things like geographic knowledge. The judiciary is incentivized just to care about rights, which means they will curb the executive in its entirety. You're ultimately nebulous hippies who want to engage in war in some like human rights way, and I simply think those are mutually, in, mutually exclusive values that you can't have. Let's go to the, the first argument that we get, which is that uh, these are people who threats that don't deserve due process. What they fail to notice in the government is that they have yet to prove that there is a right to due process under unlawful combatants. There's no precedent for this. It's, it's nonsense. They say that there's lawful consent when, when we engage in war proper. That's often not true, right? We go to war with people who have been drafted, for example. But whatever, that's a nebulous standard that we can easily apply to the trans, like, transnational actors who are doing things like killing our troops. They consent to the, the actions that they engage in. It's a question of military efficacy, and we think we win that argument. All of your arguments in, in the debate are about why this is necessary, why, why we need to engage in this action, not a reason as to why sure. the courts are critical. Now, this, this curious gangbangers argument, right? First of all, I probably don't like the phrase gangbanging, but whatever. Sorry. We think that this, this is disanalogous in the worst way for your side of the debate. It proves that we can even domestically react in a way that circumvents due process, which is our argument. And secondly, we said it's not analogous because we're dealing with people who are transnational actors who don't have a right to due process. You have yet to provide why they would. Sorry. Now, I want to talk more specifically, no, about uh, the sort of real world implications of this. You should consider that the war in Afghanistan is one in which there's a lot of border skirmishes. There's people moving from one particular geographic location to another. It's a highly transient, shifting population, which means we don't have time to do something like funnel information back to a judiciary and then allow them to deliberate on it and then act. The opening government member talks about drone strikes and why they would be okay with them. How long do you think the window for a drone strike is? You think terrorists linger around on lounge chairs for several days, indeed weeks at a time. Of course, you'll say this is why it's all circumspect and why we can make fast decisions quick, which is code for you doing nothing. More importantly, we flagged an argument about why field agents are ultimately highly vulnerable. They're often compromised when they disclose this information. You put them at risk. You sacrifice the rights they do have, like a right to life, because they're a citizen. Bottom. So earlier in your speech, you kind of fall back on this idea that, well, there are still rights protections for these people because it goes with the chain of command at Langley, and executive people will try to protect them sometimes. Isn't this concessive that we owe them some kind of obligation and yeah. some kind of protection? No, I was just mocking the rhetoric that we got from the second speaker of opening that Obama just pushes a button or something. There's internal oversight that verifies information. That doesn't mean terrorists have rights. No, we don't think they have rights. We're at war. We killed them. You make that take longer. You actually cause our people to die. Our people have rights. Simple? Cool. Last argument. 
We think that the executive is ultimately more efficacious in this question. They haven't responded to our arguments about speed or about internal consistency of the executive. But more importantly, we've said that judges are ideologically aligned against particular people within the executive based on who nominated them. Right? More importantly, we're, we don't even have to talk about judges because we're talking about the ABA, which is more likely to elect a liberal individual, which means that they're going to protect rights even more. This is my argument about incentives. The executive has an incentive to protect people, not only our military personnel, but also civilians on the ground. This is because the nature of the war on terror requires geographic information, uh, psychocartography reference, that we don't have access to. We think that, as a consequence, we need civilian cooperation in order to be efficacious. That's an internal incentive. The judiciary does not have that incentive. All they have is an incentive towards rights protection. You're out of time. Poor form. Um, the judiciary only has an incentive for rights protection, which is why you're stuck with the roadblock instead of the speed bump. Listen, they want to have their cake and eat it too, or something like that, and it's simply the worst of both worlds. You ultimately curb our military's ability to be effective, you sacrifice the rights that our citizens, our military personnel ha have, like the right to life, in favor of nebulous rights that you haven't even proved existed. I'm, I'm at a loss. I thank the speaker for her speech and to continue the case with government, the House recognizes the member of government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So unsurprisingly, the uh, first opposition team, philosophy professor Zay, have managed to create an entire debate that is not happening in any sort of real world with any sort of, like, they have like no conception of the reality in Pakistan or how we conduct these activities whatsoever. That said, before I move on to explain all the misconceptions in that weird collection of snark we just got out of the second speaker, I just want to point out that they also didn't do the philosophy very well. So he tells us that the problem with what we're defending on site government is that there's a tension between conducting a war where you're trying to protect your own citizens' lives and protecting human rights. It's like, yes, this is true, we should still try to do it, right? Like, I will posit a thought experiment to illustrate this. So I suggest that we would probably increase the probability that U.S. civilians are not killed by terrorist acts if we were to kill everyone in Pakistan and Afghanistan by launching a bunch of thermonuclear bombs. That doesn't mean we should do that. We should probably weigh their human rights against the fact that there are terrorists there. Insofar as you think that in those circumstances, people are entitled to some legal protection because of collateral, something that hasn't been talked about in this round, and something I'm definitely going to get to an extension, we think it's pretty clear that the philosophical position they've taken in this round is absurd. That's it. The first thing I want to talk about is the rights of targets, because we hear some really, really crazy things from Professor Kilkup here. So what he tells us is that the way this works is that we've got a bunch of Green Berets running around in the Northwest Territories who suddenly find out that the Taliban are meeting in the next village and then call in an airstrike or call in a bunch of Marines to kill them. So this is not how this works, Mr. Speaker. The way this works is the CIA and the Defense Department have a running kill list which says, here are the people we know are engaged in violent yeah, yeah. activities or want to engage in violent activities against the United States. If we get actionable intelligence that we can kill them, then we will do that. So the case, which I think was pretty clearly presented to us by the first proposition team, was that we should have someone who isn't within the executive branch and who is actually qualified to be making these sorts of decisions about who is or is not a combatant making these decisions. So all we're defending in this round is how these people decide who is on the kill list. I don't see what the big problem with that is. I really think that is actually pretty simple. I don't understand why they decided to opt this in some sort of completely alternative universe. Now, the other thing they tell us is that all of these people gave up their rights because they're terrorists, right? So, look, Mr. Speaker, I think they did a pretty good job dealing with this argument on the front half. It's pretty clearly the case that not all of these people are terrorists. So here. here's the empirical reality of what we're doing in Afghanistan. So we don't actually ever send in ground troops, so it's very hard for us to tell who we have killed. But we do know this. We do know that only 300 of the 2,400 people we've killed with drone strikes were definitely on our list of enemy combatants. 1,700 of them were people who we've classified as other because we just have no idea whether they were enemy combatants. They were just people who were doing things that looked like they might have been training drills or happened to be in a place that we suspected there might possibly be terrorists. I think that's pretty weird, Mr. Speaker. I don't think that's the sort of thing a liberal democracy should be doing. The rest of the people we killed were actually children, who's who I want to talk about next. So the other thing, Mr. Speaker, no thank you, is that there are going to be collateral victims when you engage in drone strikes. And recognize that this picture we get where you're actually sending in special forces is not true at all. We did that in exactly one circumstance, and that was because we wanted to make damn sure we killed Osama bin Laden. 
and every other circumstance we're striking from the air, which means there's some risk of collateral damage. Now, James says that you might possibly be able to make some sort of argument that human beings are entitled to live qua human beings. Like, yes, Mr. Speaker, I'm willing to posit that. I could say a bunch of shit about the lottery of birth, but I think we all buy that people who are innocent are to some degree entitled to legal protection. I'll get to the at the end of this point. Now, I think a state's right to defend itself weighs against the rights claims of innocence not to be killed. But what we would tell you is that there is not always an immediate need for action. We knew where Osama bin Laden was for months before we actually killed him. We think that insofar as this is true about other less important commanders, we probably have time to have a trial at which we say, so here is the situation. We're going to have to kill a bunch of innocents to take this guy out. Is it something that we should actually be doing? I think that the executive branch is not qualified to make this decision because while they may be harmed by the strategic implications that come about when you kill innocent people, they are not harmed by the intrinsic rights violations that occur. I think you need an adversarial system where the innocent victims also have representation. Front half. Okay, I just want more on that point actually, if you continue to explain it, because that's not sufficient. Our argument is the executive branch has an interest in winning this war successfully, which means cooperation of the Afghani and Pakistani government, and their people, whereas the judiciary, as we said, is likely to be liberal, likely to be concerned about these ideological to James, which James, James you literally just didn't listen to the last thing that I said. So what I told you is that, yes, they have a strategic interest. However, there is something else at play here. It's not just a question of strategy. It's also a question of the fact that all of the innocent children, all of the people classified as other, have rights and deserve to be legally represented. And insofar as the executive branch has no incentive to care about that claim, there needs to be some way that that claim is inserted into the decision-making calculus. I'll take back half, because that was such a bad POI. Uh, Go ahead. I don't think these children are being killed because they were determined in the kill list. I think they're just being killed as collateral because the mechanism was wrong. The drone strikes are the problem. Uh, okay, I mean, I, I'm really looking forward to the knife that's clearly coming from you guys. So what, what I think we would say pretty clearly that is that insofar as we've decided someone is on the kill list, and we also know we're going to kill 20 innocent school children if we kill this person, we should probably have some sort of legal process that determines whether that's an acceptable action to take. And it probably shouldn't be some guy sitting down at Langley who spends all of his time killing Muslims anyway who makes this decision. The second thing I want to talk about is a theory of government and consent. Because Professor Kilkoff tells us something else interesting, which is that we are at war. So this is not strictly speaking true. So in the immortal words of Will Jones, there is a lacuna in the current law, Mr. Speaker. The United States has a tripartite government, and the right to declare war is very clearly a right that is given to the people through their representatives in Congress. Now, under the status quo, we have not declared war on Pakistan or on the sort of groups that we're concerned with, and it's not even possible to declare war on them, because in order to do that, we would just have to give the executive the right to kill anybody who he thinks is a threat to the United States, which is not the sort of thing I think we should be doing. I tell you that this is deeply problematic, because there are deep normative questions that the polity has to have some sort of oversight here. Recognize that waging war requires moral calculations of things like proportionality, of things like discrimination, of who actually constitutes an illegal combatant, and of to what degree it's okay to kill innocent people in order to constitute illegal combatants. I think these people have rights claims, but I also think it's important that the equality has normative oversight over the decisions that we're making. I don't think you can just let the executive branch take carte blanche and then go and kill whoever the hell they want. Now, here's why the ABA is better, even if it's not perfect. So. Well, first he's got this argument about nominees. We don't need to worry about that because they're not politically appointed. That's the point of having the ABA use it. Thank you for explaining why this is a good model. But second, he tells us the ABA is weird because they collect dues. So it's not an argument, Mr. Speaker. The ABA is kind of a weird actor, but what we would tell you is that they set the normative standards for lawyers in the United States. We think they're perfectly capable of appointing someone who will make ethical decisions since they decide who is ethical enough to be a lawyer under the status quo. I think that this is probably the sort of thing we need in a democracy that's killing a bunch of people. I'm incredibly proud to propose. I thank the speaker for his speech and continue the case for the opposition. House recognizes the member of opposition. understanding what exactly the government wants us to do. So let me explain to the entire house what's actually happening. So we have a kill list of about 300 people. And we refer each and every one of these individuals to this secret federal court. The court has a year-long proceeding where this, where this faceless, nameless individual has a defense 
And then after the year-long process, we have determined whether this person is guilty or innocent, or presumably guilty or presumably innocent. Under this mechanism, we just simply don't understand why we will be wasting so much time killing en enemies to the state. That is the kind of proposition that Closing Half wants you to believe. That we have a kill list and that is the only people that we are going to target, nobody outside it. What the opening opposition tells you, opening government tells you instead, is that the legal system works like a warrant system, where you call up the judge at 12 a.m. in the middle of his after-dinner snack, and, and you tell him, you know what, we have a problem that's happening in Afghanistan, we need procedures that need to be made, and you call up magically some defense person that's going to defend the guy who doesn't have a name or a face in Afghanistan, and you ask him to defend that individual, and all the entire due process of cross-examination, of fair representation of that individual as an innocent person, presumed innocent until guilty, happens within the 15 minutes that you have between or ha having the execution order and actually having the guy blown up. We simply think that the model that opening and closing are proposing are co contradictory, counterproductive to a war against terror. No, thank you. The idea that we're going to talk about, the extension is, and we're going to include the re refutations as, as I go on, is the inherent difference between the judiciary system and the executive. We tell you, Mr. Speaker, the purpose of the judiciary system is to ensure a free and fair trial that respects the rights of individuals. What is this ju judiciary system supposed to do? They believe in due process. They believe in a trial where you have fair representation by people who care about the alleged criminal, by people who care about the state, and that essentially are inherently biased against the person that they're defending themselves because, that def because the person you're defending is anti-US. We see after all of this process where you want to cross-examine the FBI or the CIA officials years on end and then you essentially have a, a verdict where the person is innocent or guilty. We think the entire process is counterproductive because the judiciary's duty is to uphold free, fair trials. We do not see, A, that these persons will get free and fair trials, even if we believe that they have that right. But more importantly, we don't think that this person has the right to a free and fair trial. Why is that? Let's understand why terrorists do not have the same amount of rights as me, a visiting non-American. The problem with terrorists is that they kill the people of America, or they otherwise threaten the right of people's right to liberty, right to so sovereignty, pursuit of happiness, so on and so forth. What we think is that targets and might be aren't terrorists. They aren't intended to kill, they're simply collateral damages. What we think does not happen is that the president orders 20 school children to be killed in a village in Afghanistan because they weren't looking pretty. We think what happens is you go on a strike and these people end up dead. When you allow the court to decide, and this is particularly important, when you allow the court to make a value judgment of whether we should go and kill 25 people in order, 25 innocent people in order to get Osama bin Laden, what you're essentially allowing is the court to decide whether we should be killing innocent people, innocent people in order to save the life of that war, in order to, you know, maximize some greater utility in the abstract that is not going to happen. We think this giving this right to the judiciary under any circumstances, whether it be an independent bar guy or something, essentially runs contradictory or counterproductive to the very tenet of the judicial system, which is to ensure equal rights, equal representation, yes. and equality for everybody on the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Anybody? Uh, which one? Yeah, which one? Okay. Put yourself in the position of someone from the northwest region of Pakistan. Why on earth would they buy any of your rhetoric that like they have no accountability because they are an unlawful combatant and aren't a citizen? Why on earth does that make it okay to just get rid of them even though they might not be an unlawful okay, combatant? And I, and and I, I, I come from a region very, fairly close, so I'll, 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 I'll be able to put myself in a shoe. So what makes you think I'll be okay if someone comes and tells me, oh no, wait, we've killed this person, but it's okay to kill him because some alien court in the United States somehow believes that it is legal for, 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 for these people to come and kill my people. We think none of these justifications make any sense to the Afghan people or to the Pakistani people because essentially to those people, sovereignty has been breached. My POI, which was so brilliantly misinterpreted by the opening, was essentially about we're going to violate the sovereignty of these countries regardless. What we need to do is to make sure that we don't insist
insult them even more in the process. What this is doing, this exact process is doing, is telling them that we don't believe in your sovereignty. We believe that somehow our people's security and sovereignty are above your people's security and sovereignty. When the independent Supreme Court, the champion of rights, is supposed to come and tell you that 25 innocent school children did not have the right to live because they were threatening on the abstract the lives of certain people in New York City or the Pentagon. We think it's a fundamental violation of human rights. We think it's going to have far greater social repercussions than anything that the president does. Closing. So under the status quo, what happens when there's an Al-Qaeda leader next to a school with 25 people in it is that the meathead at Langley just decides to kill all of them. On our side of the house, there's some chance that doesn't happen. So shouldn't you be supporting the proposition? So under, under your paradigm, the Al-Qaeda leader goes free because we do not have the time in order to kill him. Or what, what, what does the court exactly do? Does the court exactly weigh Osama bin Laden's life again, say, you know what, if we're going to have to kill 80 people to kill OBL, then we're fine. If we're having to kill 81 people, then that's a no. We just don't understand the kind of line that you're trying to draw, right? We juxtapose the purpose of the judiciary, which is equal representation and equal rights, against a presidential order or the executive order, who as commander-in-chief of the army has the right to ask the army to do whatever the army requires in order to protect the sovereignty of the great nation that happens to be the United States. We think eight times of war, the president or the commander-in-chief has that right to do anything and not be as accountable to the people or not be as insulting to the people of Afghanistan and Pakistan. That's a champion of human rights coming up and telling them, you know what, your children were not as important as our children because our children are white, our Christians are superior than your children. That's insulting, that's damaging. We lose the war that way. Thank you. I thank the speaker for his speech and to conclude the case for the government, the House recognizes the government for it. Here, Mr. Speaker, just because in the status quo we do let the executive take certain actions, and we do accord the executive wide authority to kill whomever they want. It doesn't mean that that's a normatively good policy or a moral policy. We've suggested changing that. We have a number of reasons for why that's the case. So first of all, I want to talk about when this policy actually matters to give you a little bit of framing for the round. Then I'm going to talk about whether or not the people we're killing have some kind of rights that we ought weigh against other concerns. And finally, I want to talk about what's, uh, who is actually the best actor for determining military policy. Uh, but before I do that, just one piece of rebuttal didn't quite fit anywhere else. Uh, we, we hear a bit from Closey about this idea of violating national sovereignty. I just want to point out that actually, in many circumstances, the U.S. probably does work with governments like Yemen or Saudi Arabia when it carries out strikes like these. So in the majority of cases, there isn't a major national sovereignty violation. But we, we actually tell you that even if there were, you ought to defer towards weighing the rights of things like protections. And if you really were concerned with violating national sovereignty, then a court with legal experts is much better at determining when we should and shouldn't take these kinds of actions for an expected payout than military commanders who always want to pursue a particular course of action. I think that's important to keep in mind. That said, on to more important questions. Not this time. So, first of all, when does this policy action matter? So, in most cases, that, uh, at least as we hear it portrayed from from, Sy from from opening up and to a certain extent from closing, uh, we think that they would be really horrible if we got some new information about a previously unknown Al-Qaeda leader who is only going to be at one place for 30 minutes. I think on both sides of the house, that Al-Qaeda leader still dies because we recognize that the urgency of the situation and the extreme potential danger means that we can outweigh whatever potential rights this person might have had. So we don't think the existence of this court actually affects that person. We no one on this side ever defended that. But when does this matter? And note, the resolution talks about targeted killing. 
So when we're thinking of making a targeted kill list of Al-Qaeda leaders who we want to kill, that's some, oftentimes a list that is long-standing. It took years to kill Osama bin Laden. So in these cases, we think there is plenty of time to decide whether or not the people on this list actually have committed the crimes we're effectively giving them the death penalty for, or if they actually do deserve to be at the, uh, facing the brunt of America's, uh, of America's wrath. We think in these cases, it is especially important because we are able to weigh rights, we are able to consider other factors. I think at the very, very least, you defer for taking a longer view of issues like these closely. So you think that you're going to win the war by only taking down named hotshots of Al-Qaeda and not leave you know, and leave anybody who's not the hotshot who well, doesn't no, have a name. We, we think it's also in, important to take on like normal military actions, but we do think it's partially important to like decapitate vast terrorist operations because yeah. there's a reason people are leaders. It's because they're the best at doing what they do. When you remove them, they have someone who is worse necessarily does that. I think that's a different debate entirely. So, second question is, do the people we place on these targeted killing lists, that they're oftentimes specific people, not just generally people, uh, because that's the nature of targeting this, do they have some kind of rights that merit being weighed in a court? So, first of all, we tell you, we do have some kind of obligation to weigh the rights of others versus our security. We tell you, especially with people who may or may not be guilty of crimes, yeah. we should at least consider whether or not they are. Maybe we have insufficient evidence, but in those cases, the court can still issue you a recommendation, especially when time isn't pressing. But moreover, we tell you, you can only really consider these types of things in a non-biased setting, without military commanders who have an incentive for things like career advancements, or incentives to just kill all the terrorists because that's their job. We tell you also, and we don't really get engagement to Sam's argument, that it's oftentimes the case that there just isn't a declaration of war with these people. And that things like just war theory may not explicitly apply, but the people involved still deserve the types of protections, like proportionality, or minimizing the damage we cause to these yeah. people. We tell you that a court full of legal scholars, or people who understand the law and how to weigh these types of considerations, and how this fits within international law, is a much better actor at taking into consideration these these types of questions than is a military uh, a set of military leaders. I'll get to you in just a second. And we tell you this is also true when you're thinking about these people who typically don't set the normative tone for society, that military commanders are especially insular. We think when you need to, when, you, when insofar as we need to consider the types of circumstances in which we haven't declared war, a court is far, far better. We think they should at least weigh the rights of people. But the professor disagrees. Yeah, where in the model do they indicate that this ABA judge would, in addition to determining the guilt of the potential non-combatant target, the judge would also determine the proportionality and discrimination concerns of the method of attack, i.e., your kid's extension is irrelevant. Look, 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 courts weigh lots of different factors in all different circumstances. How certain we are a particular piece of evidence is good enough, i.e., whether or not other, uh, uh, whether or not a particular like fact gathered from the CIA about how pressing an action is, is evidence enough to convict a certain person or evidence enough to issue a recommendation to be placed on the list. Uh, well, one last thing at this point, but we, we tell you, at the very least, the collateral damage accorded to, to innocents and people who die as a result not on this list merits consideration and merit weighing, the type of weighing that happens much more effectively in a court. Insofar as closing off is concerned about innocents dying, we tell you it happens far less on our side of the house when they have some kind of judicial protection. We think that's actually far better, and we protect the rights of far more people people in our side of the house while still generally preserving the most important military operations. Which leads to my last point. Who is actually the best actor for adjudicating the types of military operations? We tell you that first of all there are just inherent incentives. That military officials have a low deference to the idea of rights of others and types of security implications in terms of collateral damage. That they are empirically very bad at weighing things like PR disaster effects that come when you just kill a lot of in innocents. But also that they just simply overuse and oftentimes aren't circumspect about the important things that Sam talked about in his speech that really didn't get responded to. We tell you that it's simply the case that even if you were concerned about a court not being speedy enough, we think that oftentimes we'd still be able to take military actions, but in many cases, courts issue quick warrants, and especially types of national security courts, the officials are able to do things like answer phone calls at the middle of the night to make sure we take the best action possible. 
Finally, we also just tell you, in terms of military policy, insofar as courts are able to take into consideration the types of kill lists the CIA and DOD actually have, that they're effectively just as good, but less biased than the military commanders. So military policy and strategy aren't hurt, but we at the very least increase the likelihood that we protect the rights of other people who we generally think deserve, have some right to life. We're very proud to have proposed. I thank the speaker for his speech and to conclude the case for the opposition house recognizes the opposition whip. Yeah. funny sense of the criminal justice system if you think it amounts to it's the best we can do under the circumstances system where it's okay we'll kill innocent children but this way it's a little bit more legitimate because this champion of human rights this you know court of justice has decided that as opposed to a CIA meathead I don't think that's what a criminal justice system should be about if you're actually gonna give somebody a free and fair trial you should give them an actual free and fair trial where they can be upheld to the standards of justice where they can have a good chance to defend themselves and moreover, which does not immediately say it's okay to kill innocent people in the process of apprehending or killing this particular person. For example, a criminal justice system would not say that it's okay to kill, I don't know, a crime lord's children and wife in the process of apprehending that crime lord. That's not a decision a court can take in the case of any you know, you know, judgment, and it should not have the right to take that same kind of decision to say it's okay to kill a, you know, 20 school children while killing this one terrorist. See, you cannot have a different standard for this particular court as opposed to all the other courts in the country. However, so having said that, what was important in this debate? In my mind, one, can you basically arbitrarily kill a foreign citizen anyways and yet feel good about yourself because you gave them this facade of a court, this false pseudo-justice that you talk about. Number two, are local allies and the people that on the ground more likely to be infuriated or you know, less likely to be accepting of a breach of their sovereignty and their lives and their security by a presidential or executive order or by an order given out by the systematic court which still kills innocent people? And the last one, of course, is the military really this gung-ho institution that will randomly and mercilessly kill anybody who wants to, as many people as it wants to, until it arrives at no enemies at all. On Here's how we order it. I'll take yours first. Go ahead. So you say the military is this wanton killer. But what system do you think is better? The system where the CIA and the executive branch can let the military do what they want, or one where a court arbitrates the ability for them to do that, thus probably stopping some of the killing second opposition faces in the oh, Okay, problem. you don't have a halfway court where you try to put up the closest facsimile to justice as you possibly can, and then say this was the better way. So I say if you're going to kill somebody anyways, stop lying about it, stop wasting time about it, get it done efficiently, sure. and, and go ahead with it. And don't lie to us and insult our intelligence that this was the right thing to do or the better thing to do. Sit down, please. So, firstly, can you arbitrarily kill these people? I firstly think, of course, you can because you can't have a pseudo-justice where, you know, it's the best we can do scenario because ultimately, let's get down to it. You've decided a, for, a foreign, you know, a sovereign, a f citizen of a sovereign country is a threat to your security and as a result, regardless of any rights he might have under the country that he is a citizen of, you have to kill him anyways. So if you've reached that decision and ultimately there is no way of circumventing the need to kill him, just go ahead and kill him anyways. However, this court system you talk about is not really going to give him a new set of rights because one, Whoever is appointed to defend him doesn't know him. He's a nameless, faceless per person he's supposed to be defending, who he himself knows or generally presupposes is an enemy to his own country, and therefore probably doesn't even have that much incentive to do, you know, represent him properly. So it's not really a, set, a, you know, a, a standard of justice that would you know, hold up in the you know, regular world, a regular criminal justice system. So it's actually just a facade. You're not actually giving a proper you know, system of representing yourselves. And moreover, these people, do they even know that they're, they're being put on trial? Are they really asked to provide some sort of evidence for themselves in order, you know what, I am not a terrorist and this is why I'm not a terrorist? I don't think you provide for those. So how can you call this even you know, a legitimate in any way? I don't get that. Please sure. sit down. So, and moreover, beyond that and above and beyond that, I think courts have a greater, you know, impetus 
to actually be a champion of rights and to be absolutely right as opposed to somewhat better than the executive because if you're going to refer this to a uh, you know, judicial court then that judicial court has to live by the standards that all, all the judicial courts go to and moreover a judicial court can never ever under any circumstances decide it's okay to kill an innocent person in the apprehension of killing a guilty person that's not a decision a court can make and under your model that's essentially the exact decision the court is you know mandated to make and we think that's wrong i'll take lower please so it very rarely happens that we find out both about a major al-qaeda leader we've never heard of and where he is at the same time but when it does there are two possibilities either we have so much evidence of it that we can come to a decision in 45 minutes and kill him or we don't have enough evidence to make that decision in the time frame and we shouldn't be killing him anyway um to begin with if you're going to kill him anyways, and he's not going to have a chance to represent himself, whoever you assign to represent him doesn't know him and probably hates him as an enemy of the state anyways, you're not really coming up with a proper justice system to determine killing him. So if you're going to kill him unlawfully anyways, kill him according to whatever you feel is the most effective way to kill him, as opposed to wring your hands about was his rights protected, because his rights are not being protected anyways. So moving on to that. Um, uh, what about the people on the ground? I think if there is a choice between, you see, the ch ch parents of the dead children don't really care as to whether their children were killed by a CIA meathead or whether their children's death was mandated by a court of justice. I think they'll be just as upset anyways, they'll be just as infuriated anyways. However, it's a lot easier for the people of Pakistan or Afghanistan to accept that this was a decision made by a president during a war as a, as a hard act necessary for a war rather than a systematic decision made by the American criminal justice system that determines systematically and through a fair process that their children had to die. I think that's not only insulting, it's a lot more infuriating because now America is a systematic killer of children as opposed to a country whose president took a hard decision during a war. I think one is definitely worse than the other. And, and, and of course it inflames the people more and leads to more of the burn the infidel America sentiment. So that, that's also wrong. And lastly, of course, I don't think the military is as bad as you say it is and arbitrarily goes around killing people because I think a career advancement of a military officer or a general will, will be halt, halted if he's and takes part in wanton massacres of people. I think the Congress will probably block that as well. And, and so, um, ultimately, in any case, we're not having a scenario where, you know, you suspect that Islamabad might have an Al-Qaeda operative in it, therefore, you wipe out Islamabad. You obviously have to go through a set of, I don't know, qualifiers and a set of review that probably has at least as much depth to it and maybe more than your court trial system because all you're doing is adding a pseudo-legitimate defender or law defense lawyer to the system that already exists. And I think that's not only inefficient in terms of getting the job done, it's not only insulting to the people who might lose innocent you know, loved ones in getting it done, but moreover, doesn't really provide a greater you know, level of rights that it otherwise would happen. Therefore, we feel on these three grounds that one, you are ultimately arbitrarily killing somebody and you're not really giving them the level of justice that you say they are giving. It's not actually any level of legitimate justice at all. Two, it's a lot worse when you systematically decide innocent people have to die as opposed to a war decision. Systematically decide through a court and the champion of human rights, no less. And lastly, the military isn't really all that bad at making those decisions in the first place. For these reasons, we think that was totally wrong. Thank you very much.